Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, a Wise Lost Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s GI Joe Tour review. And I'm going to be taking a look at the vehicle that I unboxed and assembled just last week, the Cobra Ballistic Battle Ball 1987 Pogo. The Pogo makes its first comic book appearance in the old Marvel comic run of GI Joe in issue number 59. It unfortunately does not make any cartoon appearances but it did make an appearance in the 1990 NES G.I. Joe video game as a player rideable vehicle. Now if you're wondering whether POGO stood for anything, unfortunately P-O-G-O -O is not an acronym for anything, at least as far as I can tell. It was unfortunately named after the POGO stick. Before I get into the features of the POGO, I'd like to demonstrate a little bit how this thing moved around for the benefit of those who aren't familiar with the Pogo as a toy or even its uh, role in the comic books. Now with this big thrusters on the bottom you might think that this is a purely aerial vehicle but it isn't. What these look like landing legs and in a way they are are its main source of propulsion. You'll notice that it has these big coils sculpted on there and that's meant to propel this thing up and down. Basically it hopped up and down uh, as its uh, method of movement but you could also say that it uses that as its method of dodging ground fire as this is sort of I guess 50 percent a ground vehicle at the very least. The thrusters would probably add some height to its jumping ability but as demonstrated in the uh, comic book the thrusters could also alter its trajectory mid hop so it could really dodge even aerial fire at that point. And while that's actually a fairly interesting concept and the fact that spring powered mobility is extremely efficient when used correctly, the fact of the matter is, is that this toy has a very interesting concept which doesn't work. Like it's, it's not a gimmick of the toy. You can't physically make this thing jump up and down which is really unfortunate. Because, like I said, it's a very interesting concept, but if a kid can't explore that concept, especially if it's just so unique, what's the point? You have these thrusters on the bottom of them. I'm sure a kid would just use this as an aerial vehicle just by itself. Taking a look at its features first, on the bottom here, we have some thrusters which on the back of the box say that they pivot, but they actually don't. What they mean is the entire bottom area actually rotates around. I believe that's more of the benefit of the machine gun. And as for the machine gun itself, you can actually rotate it up and down. As a matter of fact, it actually pivots up quite a, quite a range here, as well as down almost completely. So next, we have the hobo missiles. And <laughs> Yeah, I'm not making that up. Hobo standing for homing bomb system. Seriously, it's like Hasbro is actually trying to make me hate this vehicle. But really, I don't. And they're just on your hard points there. The instructions on the box are show you to put the missiles in an upright position, which really doesn't make much sense to me because if this thing is going to be hopping over its targets, you'd want them pointing downwards at the very least. Unfortunately, you can't point them in any other direction. Now here's the weird thing about the Pogo, is that if you saw my unboxing and assembly uh, video, you saw that the Sprout tree only came with two missiles. And yet, there are actually spots for three. Obviously, they just molded one type of leg, which is what these things are attached to. So you're kind of you're just kind of left with um, one of these just being empty. The uh, Pogo is not a particularly hard vehicle to find, and parts aren't really hard to find either. So you can actually find sellers who actually sell these things with three missiles even though to be complete you only need two and on the top 
we have a clamshell canopy to reveal the cockpit. It's a very interesting design and this is basically where the whole ballistic battle ball thing came into play because that's really the only ball portion of this thing. If you were just to go by the the whole hull and ball top, I would actually say this is more like a an ice cream cone rather than a pure ball, but you know, whatever. Inside we have a really nicely molded cockpit, lots of instrument detail there, and a pair of joysticks on either side. I would however say that a figure is Despite the fact that it looks like a figure could actually stand up in there, it really can't. It has, it's actually kind of cramped. And uh, a figure is uh, kind of have to be squeezed into there. For a demonstration of that, I'm going to be using my 1987 Battle Armor Cobra Commander. Let's open this up and make sure he's in his most uh, bent proportions, or sitting proportion here. And just pop them right in there. And he looks good in there. But his head is very close to the top of the canopy. As a matter of fact, I won't even bother doing a comparison with modern action figures being in there. I just don't believe a forage figure is simply going to fit in there. It just, it just isn't. If you're wondering what the opposite number to the Cobra Pogo would be, despite it being, well, pretty unique, I think that we can all agree that it does have one, and that is the G.I. Joe Skyhawk. Now here I have the Sky Patrol version of the Skyhawk, but they're virtually the same thing. With this thing being able to hop around and maybe even change direction mid-hop, I think it's pretty equal to the pivoting engines which allow this thing to kind of turn on a dime uh, mid-glide. This thing also has very comparable weaponry as well with the Skyhawk's front chin guns as well as only two missiles which is pretty much the equal of the uh, Pogo. I can't really say that the Pogo took over from any previous Cobra vehicle it's fairly unique in what it does and how it does it. I would say the closest thing I can think of is the 1985 Trouble Bubble or Cobra Flight Pod with its very round features. But even then, that's more of a light patrol vehicle, whereas this thing is a forward strike vehicle. Honestly, one of the things that I really wanted this vehicle for was because to me, it looked more like something which hopped around from crater to crater on the moon. And as you know, I have the 1987 Defiant Space Shuttle, but there's really no opposite number for that. Despite the fact that we also have the Stellar Stiletto. But this is a one-man vehicle, and actually came with a pilot. But in the same year we get this, we also get the Astro Viper, one of my favorite Cobra Vipers, in fact, they've really grown on me. Despite the fact that they do look a little bit alien. So I think it's actually fairly appropriate that I would use these guys to pilot this. Now, if you can't overwhelm something as large as the Defiant Space Shuttle with an opposite number, you can at least overwhelm them with numbers of tinier vehicles. And that's what I'm going to do here in my displays. Like I said, the uh, battle ball here, despite the fact that it seemed to have a lot of length down here, it's actually kind of crammed the seat wise. So despite the fact that most three and three quarter inch figures ought to fit in here, figures with large helmets like the Astro Viper are a little bit cramped. But I can still squeeze him in there and he still looks like he belongs in there. Especially with this red and gray color scheme. It just goes so well with this. And the red and gray color scheme goes so well with the Stellar Stiletto. So they look like they're part of the same squadron. 
Many people pointed out in the comments section of the previous video, my unboxing and assembling of the Cobra Pogo, that Hasbro did indeed make the Pogo a space vehicle later on. They reused the mold for the Pogo and turned it into a vehicle called the Invader for the 1993 Star Brigade subline. The 1993 Astro Viper released the same year and they share the same color scheme, the black, neon, green and gold. And while I actually don't mind that color scheme for a space vehicle, I still prefer the Cobra Red. If you're looking for a Pogo on the aftermarket, they're actually fairly easy to find, absolutely complete. They really don't go for that much on the aftermarket and any value that you really have to pay for is probably because of the complexity of the vehicle and not its popularity. Of course, there are a few things that you do have to look out for, like missiles and the antenna, which are pretty much the things that you would lose on any G.I. Joe vehicle. But there are a few other specific things, like this large hose, which doesn't really snap into the uh, fuselage of this thing very well. There are also these hoses on the prototype version of this toy. These were standard G.I. Joe black hoses. Unfortunately, they went for something unique. And because of how odd this vehicle is, some people, well, some sellers, don't photograph this very well. So it's hard to see with these things attached whether you get them all or not. Uh, some, sometimes they're actually fairly easy to pop off, and sometimes they're easy to just break off, unfortunately. So you need three of these rather oddly shaped little hoses, but you also need a fourth hose, which is actually rather long and doesn't have that odd little curve at the end. Now I tend to think that one of the reasons why some people like this thing or hate this thing is actually partly the same reason. As the Pogo is heavily associated with the Armored Cobra Commander in the comic books. Now some people tend to think of the Armored Cobra Commander as being rather an imposter Cobra Commander and that being his vehicle of choice just makes that equally uh, bad taste in their mouth. I can't really say that the bullet, the, despite the fact that I think most of the value that you get out of the, oh, well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.